Namu tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhu dasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo saranto sucedoye olahudi sammeao sanputoshi. Namo saranto sucedoye olahudi sammeao sanputoshi. Wushang shen shen wei miao fa. By Chien Wan Jin and Zhao Yu, Wo Jin Jian Wan Yen Jie Rulai Jian Shi Yi and its knees. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, Shifu Shangren, Goei Shishong, Dajia, Omi Tofo, Venerable Master, hello to everybody, all of you who have joined us today on Sunday, April 26th here in Queensland, Saturday, April 25th in California and around the world for our Flower Garland Sutra lecture today. We are looking into the 10, pract- the, uh, ten stages chapter of the Flower Garland Sutra. We're on stage 10 called the Stage of the cloud of Dharma, Fa Yun Di. And it's, uh, we've had a, a good run of narration uh, where the story moves ahead with people doing things in our sutra. That, uh, that comes to a close today, and what follows it is the uh, instruction part of the tenth stage, where this is how it's built, that there's the essential chapter is about teaching bodhisattvas how to to progress in their studies of how to help people wake up how to ease people out of their pain that's what the chapter is about and it goes step by step kind of like a school curriculum and we're at the top the bodhisattva is in his you could say his last semester of uh, studies and <laughs> learning how to be a bodhisattva and the narration is, uh, there, there's times in each chapter where the story just moves ahead and there's a, uh, a kind of, a, the, uh, the narrator comes in and says, and then this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And then after, when that's over, which today is our last piece of that, um, then comes what the Bodhisattva needs to know to qualify for this, uh, for this particular, uh, this particular bit of instruction, right? So, that's where we are. Let's look at our text. Um, Here we are. We're going to come back to page... We're going to come back to page 24 after we do the invocation, which is right there. Okay, people who are looking at the screen can find that bit of text. Right? It's actually a sacred name. And today we're going to welcome that in with a uh, fretless tack head banjo. Uh, made by uh, Naro Mason here in in Victoria, Australia. Here we go. Namo da fa guang fo wa yen jing wa yen hai wei o pu sa namo da fa guang fo wa yen jing wa yen hai
So good to me. I just, so. Handmade instruments out of simple materials that bring so much joy to people's hearts. Music, indeed. <clears throat> it's a bright light in the dark. Um, because I spend a fair amount of time uh, with music and musical instruments, stringed instruments, uh, the community of friends who I've met uh, in that pursuit, the the people who build and play and appreciate uh, the music that those instruments make uh, are all coming forward now in this time of quarantining, in this time of sheltering in place, in the time of uh, social distancing, they're coming forward to uh, put their music online so that uh, people find some solace, they find some a safe harbor, they find some uh, shelter from the storm, and also community uh, in the music. It is a music is a universal goodness in during hard times and during times of celebration as well. So many of my friends in the musical community are are uh, performing songs f- with uh, sitting in front of a computer or a phone or a tablet and singing just for that screen. But the magic of the internet takes that screen and opens it up to the world, to the universe. So it's like a window in front of that window, you could say, not just a screen. Screen sounds one-dimensional, right? But it's an actual window. There's On the other side of that window are those of us who appreciate uh, music's ability to lighten the heart. So that's uh, one of the, truly one of the silver linings of this uh, time of quarantine. Now, um, to our sutra, we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, What is going on is our bodhisattva uh, in training in the 10th stage, uh, our flower garland sutra is about training bodhisattvas and our this bodhisattva, as I said, is about to, uh, about to graduate, about to get to what? To Buddhahood. Now this bodhisattva's wisdom is the same as a Buddha. Now, that sounds far away. That sounds out there somewhere in the clouds. Uh, think of it this way. This bodhisattva has removed the coverings from his human mind. So his, his mind is pretty much fully awake, fully alight. There's not much wooming, not much ignorance, not much avidya, right? Lack of light anymore. Uh, All the shadows are gone now. And consistent, we we haven't said this uh, so far, but it's what is clear in this this section of text is that um, in order to to, uh, cross the threshold in order to walk up on the stage, go up over the risers, walk across to the podium where the, the chancellor and the dean of instruction and maybe the founders or the board of directors uh, or the trustees or the faculty are waiting to welcome you and say, you have graduated, here's your diploma. In order to do that, uh, you have to actually, in the sutra, what we've been looking at is the graduation ceremony. What have we been calling it? We've been talking about uh, consecration, abhisheka in Sanskrit, where uh, oil or water, in this case it's water from the four oceans, are dribbled on the top of the head of the graduate, and he, he or she graduates, and becomes someone who has reached the da zhi wei, 
da zhi zhi wei, right? The position of appointment to great wisdom. And we've been looking at, uh, and what I haven't pointed out is they, uh, this is something we heard from our founder, Master Shren Hua, over and over again, was that in order to make progress in the Buddha Dharma, you get, uh, you have to be certified, they said. You have to pass. You have to go through the testing of one who knows to become one who knows equally. And Master Hua would, would extrapolate on that. He would say a second stage bodhisattva uh, knows the first stage bodhisattva's attainment and wisdom and compassion. But the first stage bodhisattva does not know the stage of wisdom or compassion of the second stage or on up third, fourth, fifth, etc. Um, you can't claim you're enlightened for yourself. That's the point. That uh, this, is, this is actually testable, verifiable, certifiable to, uh, let's see, we have a comment that the audio is a bit low. Let me turn up my mic. I'm going to turn the dial on my mic here. Hope that'll improve things. I can also bring it closer. You don't want to look at it, do you? No. Okay. We'll put it out of the frame, but still closer. There we go. Tell me if that volume has improved. Is that louder? Say it is so. Yep. We're okay. Is that, does that improve things? Um, I can also speak up. Let's do that. Um, you want to type in a comment there? Does that improve things? Cherry, much better. Good. All right. Gratitude to the tech crews on this side here in Queensland, Sam and Cliff, and on that side, Cherry and Locke, putting things, uh, putting things out for the audience to, for the assembly to be able to enter. Ideally, we want to make all the technology vanish so that people who are listening to the Avatamsaka Sutra can go right through the my, my voice, this your computer, your phone, your iPad or tablet into the heart of the sutra. That's what we're trying to do. And the technology is getting better and better. Thank goodness for Zoom. Um, if you were one of those few shareholders in Zoom software, uh, in January there was something like uh, 10 million users, and now in April there's something like 300 million users of that software. So we want to go through those tools right to your ears, through your ears, right to your heart so that the sutra speaks to you. That's the goal of this exercise, right? We're in this exercise, we're in the enterprise together, learning how to, to discover the sutra's wisdom and compassion inside each of us. That's our goal. So we want, of course, we want the uh, volume to be suitable, right? Suitable to be uh, adequate. All right, let me know if you can't hear. Locks is okay, good, more is better. I'll turn it up to the max. There we go, all right, that's it for this mic. Um, and I also want to appreciate that in Berkeley, uh, the Sangha is listening. So uh, we have uh, Jin Fo, we have Jin He, we have Jin Chuan, we have Jin Wei, Dharma Masters listening in. And um, if you want to, if you would like to contribute comment or reflection, a uh, suggestion, please type. You just open up your chat there and say, got a comment or raise your hand and uh, I will definitely uh, invite you to speak. All right, that would be great. Thank you for that. I'll thank you in advance. And this is uh, the more collaborative this experience can be, the better. Uh, that there are real human beings here listening to the sutra and having thoughts, having uh, inspiration. So, so, Jin Jin Fo Shi Ra, Jin He Shi, Jin Chuan Shi, you men, da jia Jin Wei Shi ha, you men, ju shou yao yao jiang hua, yao ti gong zi ji bao gui de yi jian, bu yao ke qi ah. Okay. 
All right. Now, so we're giving you the context, what's going on. Our bodhisattva has to be certified. You can't say you're enlightened. You have to have somebody who knows that and who can say, yeah, I look at you, I listen to you, you're, you're on. That's one of the reasons that we love the Six Patriarch Sutra, right? Six Patriarch Sutra has that inyo, inyo, yo, 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 inyo chapter called the, the uh, uh, Lively Encounters chapter, where 21 people come in front of Master Huineng Dashi, uh, Liu Zhu Huineng Dashi, the Sixth Patriarch, Master Huineng, and he has an interview with them and says, yes, indeed, you, your wisdom and the Buddha's wisdom are the same. Your mind is free of the darkness of confusion and affliction. You're awake. Well done, right? That's, and that chapter is, that's immortal. That chapter is, is here for the long run because we, when we read it, we think, oh, what's the difference between uh, let's say Master uh, Xuanjie, uh, known as Yongjia uh, Dashi, uh, right? Who compiled, probably compiled the Song of Enlightenment, Zhang Dao Ge, and he met the Sixth Patriarch, and the Sixth Patriarch says, "Yep, yep." And they had a really great conversation, the two of them. So you know, we like that, and here. That has just happened. That has just happened. The bodhisattva, who is our model, he's our template, right? He's our test case. He's our candidate, has now qualified to the 10th stage. He has wisdom, this bodhisattva's wisdom of all 10 stages is now awake and alive in this person and he, oh boy, is a teacher. He is now, he's a healer, he's a doctor, he's a wise man, he's a medicine man, he's a shaman, he's a griot of the highest kind. Do you all know that word griot, G-R-I-O-T? This bodhisattva carries in him now, alive, the, the wisdom of the tribe. He's got everything that humanity can know and share is available to him to share, to tell, to relate, to sing, to communicate. Right? That's what this bodhisattva can do now. And what a wonderful goal, right? If you had to say, what would you like to do? If I, somebody asked me, what would you like to do? And you can choose any role in society that you can realize, that you can embody. One of my first choices would be storyteller for the tribe, the, the one who carries the lore. Right? That's, that would be one of my first choices, maybe my first choice, no second choice. Right? So our bodhisattva now, oh my goodness, at the stage of the Dharma cloud, ho ho, he has wisdom equal to the Buddha's. So, okay, that's the prelude, that's the prep, that's the background, that is the context. That's the introduction to the film, right, the setup. Now we're gonna go into today's text. What has happened? Uh, we've heard, now I, I, having built you up that way, I'm gonna step down again and say, last week, the last two or three weeks, we've been watching uh, the Bodhisattva candidate get anointed on the crown of the head. Um, why? It's an analogy. There is an actual certification of this bodhisattva's qualifications. Bona fide, right? The real deal, the real thing. And in order to communicate what's going on, the sutra said, it's just like when dot, 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 right? And what do we see? We saw a, a wheel-turning sage king, a Zhuan Lun Sheng Wang, a, uh, a Chakravartin, go through, in the analogy of the sutra, anointing of the crown of the head. We uh, found out what it was like, 
we actually went into, got photos, we got, we got not photos, we got uh, drawings and paintings of the Egyptians, the Prussians, the Russians, the French, the, uh, we didn't, I haven't come up with Queen Elizabeth's pictures of her coronation, but uh, she also went through it. Our very same beloved monarch uh, on the throne now uh, went through as a young girl that coronation when she was selected to be the queen. And it involves anointing the crown of the head. So that's what the sutra said. And now today it says, in the same way, dot, dot, dot. So now we get the other side of the analogy, right? Before it was, it's like this, so too is our bodhisattva getting, uh, going through this, uh, this ceremony whereby uh, he is now, she is now qualified, the real thing, okay? So um, 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 we're gonna start with Pusa Shouzhi Yifuru Shi, page 24, got that? Let me make it bigger here, bigger still. Here you go. All the way down to Mingwei Anju Fa Yundi. Here we go. We'll do the Chinese first. Pusa Shou Zhi Yi Fu Ru Shi Zhu Fo Zhi Shui Guan Qi Ding Gu Mingwei Shou Zhi Ju Zu Ru Lai Shi Zhong Li Gu Duo Zai Fo Shu Fo Zi Shi Ming Pusa Shou Da Zhi Zhi Pusa Itsu Da Zhi Zhi Gu Nang Xing Wu Liang Bai Qian Wan Yi Nayo Ta Nan Xing Zhi Hong Zeng Zhang Wu Liang Zhi Hui Gong De Ming Wei An Zhu Fa Yun Di All righty, English please. It is the same with a Bodhisattva who is appointed to this rank. When the Buddhas anoint the crown of his head with the water of wisdom, it is called being appointed to the rank. He, he she, fix, fit the pronoun, the pronoun the way it works for you. He can make perfect the ten powers of a Tathagata, so he is counted among the Buddhas. Disciples of the Buddha, this is known as the Bodhisattva's appointment to the ranks of great wisdom. Through this appointment, of great wisdom, the Bodhisattva can cultivate limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis, of nayutas, of practices that are difficult to do. He increases his limitless wisdom and virtue. This is called stable abiding on the stage of the Dharma cloud. Stable could be translated secure, safe, safe abiding. Anju is uh, to, to rest in peace, right? Not to be confused with R.I.P., the Bodhisattva is very alive. Stable, secure abiding on the stage of the Dharma cloud. All right, now with that, with that, finally, we are done with the preliminaries for this 10th and final stage. Every one of the stages, all 10, as we've been going through this chapter, have had something similar where there's a setup before the instruction happens for the new chapter. And this one being the tenth is the crown of all ten, the crown of the chapter, it's done. We're, we're now at the peak at the top, graduation time. So let's look at the text first of all, and it says it's the same as a bodhisattva who's been appointed to this rank, same as the Chakravartin that we've been hearing about. When the Buddhas anoint the crown of his head with the water of wisdom, it's called being appointed to the rank, to the position, to the stage, to the job. The Bodhisattva's got the job. There we go. That would be an ordinary language translation. What does it mean to anoint the crown of his head with the water of wisdom? My observation of how Master Hua um, talked about this, listening to Shurfu explain it, there's probably a yogic counterpart to this. There's probably something that's actually happening inside the, the apparatus 
of inside the body and mind of the bodhisattva. Um, the water of wisdom is probably something actually physical. My guess is, I don't know, and I won't say any more about that because I don't want to speculate, but um, what one of the, the uh, evidences, one of the proofs that if I were to make the case, if I were to write my dissertation on this, uh, is to look at the, uh, the, what do you say, universal, the, the worldwide identity of this, how identically the Egyptians did it, how Europeans did it, how the, the Jains do it. Everybody talks about this liquid coming down over the crown of the head. Um, we saw those pictures of the Jain statues that people pour ghee and milk, clarified butter, over the head of their statue to symbolize this blessing and this change, right? It's a change. Once this happens, you're, you're now enabled to do something different. So everybody around the world, historically, has, has some aspect of this, this procedure, this ceremony. So something is going on that everybody identifies with, right? Yeah, we do that too. We know what it, it's, a, it's symbolic. The external is symbolic, but inside there's something actual going on, apparently, apparently, I'm guessing. So our bodhisattva has received the water of wisdom now. And the other thing to mention is that while this is like a graduation. And what's a graduation? You're done. You're finished with your studies. But what else is it? It's a beginning. That's why they call it commencement. Isn't that interesting? The graduation ceremony is called a commencement ceremony. What is it? Our bodhisattva is now functioning as a healer, as a teacher, on a whole new level. There's nowhere fur there's no more growth of the bodhisattva's wisdom because why? Key, key to understanding, even if you're a beginning meditator, suppose you've attended your first mindfulness session, somebody sent you to this lecture to learn more about Buddhism. Doesn't matter, same principle is at work here. Suppose you're a regular, suppose you've been coming to Gold Coast Dharma Realm Sunday meditation classes for years now. Same principle. You just heard it more often because you've been coming a lot. What is the principle? We progress by subtraction. How do you know your meditation is working? It's because you have less than you had the first time you walked in the door. Less what? Less ignorance. Wu Ming, lack of light. You have a less lack of light. You have more light than before. Less darkness. You have less affliction. Why? Because something is gone. What's gone is what covered over your connection-making process. Connection with what? Connections inside your conscience. Your conscience is working for you. An example of that. Um, when I was uh, in junior high, our local, in my neighborhood, our local uh, leader, you could say, among the boys, was a tough guy. Uh, his name was Eddie, good old Eddie. Eddie was my neighbor. And Eddie tucked up the collar of his shirt, collars up. He rolled up a pack of cigarettes, camels, in his sleeve of his T-shirt. He put heel taps on the heels of his shoes so he could click his heels walking down the hallways of the school. Click, 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 click. Hooked his thumbs into his pockets and clicked with his collar up and his cigarettes. here. That was Eddie. And, oh, we wanted to be as tough as Eddie, and we wanted Eddie's uh, approval because Eddie was tough, right? Eddie was the tough guy. And we wanted to, to pass Eddie's approval. So I, in order to 
pass and be accepted into the gang, I had to smoke some cigarettes. And I tried my first <laughs> camel, right? <laughs> my first cigarette. I think I was 13 or 14. And, oh, camels. Outstanding, and they are mild. Was, was that camels or Chesterfield? I forget. But, oh, my goodness. I did not like smoking tobacco. Oof. Burns. Get the smoke in there, and it burns your throat. Makes your breath stink and turns your tongue yellow and uh, turns y yellow in your fingers here. Anyway, but I was willing to do it so that I could get the approval of the gang. And so what? Came home and my mom went, have, uh, have you been smoking? She said. And of course, I go, no, no, I have no mind. Smoking me? Ah, no, I, 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 no, nah, not going to smoke. Lied to my mother. I had been smoking. And so, uh, okay, thanks for the question. So, lying to your mother is a bad idea, it's an unsuccessful response. Um, it's an unskillful response, and there are consequences. What are the consequences? I couldn't sleep that night. Flip-flopped, back and forth, back and forth. Couldn't sleep, and I didn't quite know why. But it took another 10 years when I was out spending hours and hours and hours alone with myself in silence, not speaking to anyone else, and slowly bowing to the ground for eight hours a day. It took that experience to finally relax the muscles I had used to hold that memory of lying to my mother about not smoking, hold it down, because that was hard to face that I had done that. It took that amount of digging inside myself to get that memory to surface. I went, I was bowing all alone on the California coast, a place called Big Sur, which is 60 miles of two-lane blacktop with those Padres National Forest to the right, the Pacific Ocean on the left, whales going by, and nothing else, seagulls and wind bowing out there. And finally, one bow, up came that whole experience, and there I was, back on the street corner, smoking camels with the gang, and then lying to my mother about it because her nose smelled the tobacco smoke. And when I think back on it now, it was like my conscience was working for me. Thank goodness my conscience was working. So I've got a, a question here that Jerry has reported, he says, how do you know you have less ignorance? I know I have less ignorance when I was bowing, because why? I allowed my memory to surface and not be scared by it. What I experienced, what is ignorance? Ignorance is the muscles, you could say the psychic muscles, the mental muscles required to keep that memory down there. Carl Jung, the Swiss psycho psychologist, psychiatrist, would say what? He would say, I put that experience in the shadow of my mind. We've all got one. We got a shadow. And what is the shadow? The shadow is the place where we stuff the stuff we can't face. It's like a bag, right? So my mother asked me, was I smoking? If I, had let, if I had no ignorance, I would have said, yes, I did, Mom. I smoked with Eddie and the gang. And I, would have, I was afraid of what would have happened, right? And she would have what? She would have, who knows, scolded me, grounded me, told my dad, what? What would she have done? I don't know. But I was afraid 
to, to know what she would have done because I imagined the worst things. So I said, no, 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 I am smoking, no. Of course she knew, right? But I lied and then I couldn't sleep. So the next morning did I run down and say, mom, I lied, no, I didn't. Later, years later, when I was talking again uh, on a phone call once, calling back to Toledo to see how my mom was doing, I said, you know, mom, I really want to tell you that uh, you remember when I came home that time and you asked me if I'd been smoking and I said, no, well, that was a lie. I actually had been smoking. And her answer was, I knew that. <laughs> you couldn't fool me. I'm your mother. Right? And I said, yeah, well, I felt so bad about it because I you know, couldn't sleep at night. She said, well, I figured it would come out sooner or later. But yeah, I knew, I, I could smell it, you know. So she, my mom was, got a lot smarter than she was when I was 14 somehow. My mom got a lot smarter. No, she was plenty smart. It was me who was foolish. So the, the smoking was, what, neutral. Whether you put burning leaves in your mouth and your lungs or not is up to you. That's not a broken rule. It's a broken precept, I guess because it's sort of the mind of addiction that, that picks up tobacco and smokes it, but it's neutral. And there's nothing inherently evil in smoking. The mistake comes in saying, I had not done something that I had done. All right, so what happens when, I, when you lie to yourself and to your mother is a covering. There's an actual, probably, there's a psychic wound, I suspect. It's almost as if you sliced your arm with a knife and you're bleeding, although it's, there's not the psychic blood, right? The, the darkness is the psychic blood, I guess, the covering. And because I did that, I, in my wisdom, inherent wisdom that we call a conscience, what is it? Simple, right from wrong. To lie to your mother is wrong. To lie to yourself is wrong. Right? The, the smoking is neutral. I harm myself. I gave some money to, to Liggett and Myers, who markets camels, whoever it was, Reynolds tobacco or something. But there's no, you know, there's no other mark in the act of the smoking. It's how do you react to what, what you did. And the Buddha said, lying is an evil. It's one of the ten evils and the ten goods. So... By doing that, I created a covering over what was fundamentally the first thought. In the Chan world, in the meditation world, we call it first thought and then false thoughts. The first thought was said, yeah, I did. I smoked. Because she asked a question, simple question, simple answer. I made things very complicated for myself. And I said, no, no, I didn't know. Right. Lying, oh boy, cover over, and it had a physical effect, which was I couldn't sleep. Now, ordinary kind of kitchen psychology says conscience, thank goodness, we have in our human nature, in our mind, these, this brightness, which knows right from wrong. Conscience was because I couldn't sleep, indicated, although I couldn't, didn't know it at the time, it was saying, you hurt yourself, you sprained your mental ankle, you sprained your moral anchor, ankle. I had an, a moral sprained ankle. I tripped, and it hurts, and I couldn't sleep, because I, let's mix the metaphor, I tied a knot in my heart, and it was pinching, right? So that's a good thing to realize that we do know right from wrong. The problem is if we do it a lot, we get numb. What was a sprained ankle can become a scar, scar tissue. So that even though we can't walk any longer, we're limping along because we've sprained and reopened that wound, we can't tell right from wrong anymore. We have to work a lot to clean off the scar tissue on top of the wound, right? However, that's
Tathagata, the Buddha uh, determined to find a way to help us wake up. He says, oh, how many times have you sprained your moral ankle? How many wounds have you made? How much scar tissue do you have over that wound? Um, I've got a method for you. And it's called repentance. What does our text say? Through this appointment to great wisdom, the bodhisattva can cultivate limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis of nayutas of practices that are difficult to do. Right? What is a practice that is difficult to do? Um, saying, I was wrong. Owning up to a mistake. Admitting fault. That was wrong. That was a mistake. Saying that and seeing it is hard to do. That's a nan xing zhi heng, right? Practice that is difficult to do. And in our tradition, in our Mahayana tradition, we have numerous repentance liturgies. And gosh, repentance is such a hard word. We're scared of that word. Especially guys find it hard, harder seemingly than women to repent. Uh, women are what, closer to their wisdom, maybe? That we, that's a topic for another time. But whenever we do at our monasteries the, the repentance liturgy, we have n numbers of them. Great Compassion Repentance, Dabei Chan. We do that pretty much every day, right? We have the 10,000 Buddhas Repentance. We do that once a year, 21 days. Every other day we do the 88 Buddhas repentance ceremony, etc., etc. There's a total of, I think, 64 liturgies in the Mahayana canon, many of which have been lost over time. But we do have enough that there's a, um, probably a dozen repentance ceremony, liturgies, ceremonies that are commonly, regularly done. And when we... Uh, Whenever we do those, the women attending outnumber men about five to one on the average, but it doesn't matter. Uh, men are, get stubborn. We don't want to admit a fault. We don't want to change. Just, just do it differently next time. Why bother looking backwards? You know? Well, uh, do you want to get better is the question. Would you rather walk with a, a sprained ankle or heal it so you can run? Right? the question. Um, are you sick of being sick is the question. And in the Mahayana tradition, in our Han Chuan Fo Jiao, in our Chinese tradition, which is shared among the Koreans, the Japanese, the Vietnamese, the Tibetans, this Mahayana tradition um, is rich in repentance opportunities. And it's hard to face our our the Chinese say, are places where we were wrong, where we were not right. If we can do that, it's hard to practice and it feels really good to do it again right. To the best, I think the happiest word in this whole, uh, happiest name for, for what is called repentance would be renewal. Right? To make it new. To start over. And repentance is let the renewal. Let's just, we can drop repentance. Repentance sounds, you know, repent, sinner. That's a negative stereotype that we have. But the renewal part of the Mahayana practice is just like uh, washing your hands when you know you've been in touch with coronavirus. Right? Um, it's that it's a shower when you're hot and sweaty, right? Uh, brushing your teeth after in the morning when your teeth are all fuzzy. That feeling of renewal, coming back to what is fresh. It's that, that feeling of waking up in the morning after a good sleep and open your eyes and you're like, 
thum, and your the turbines turn over and you're ready to go. Uh, that's that's the renewal part of repentance, and we are blessed with many opportunities uh, in the Mahayana tradition. So um, that's a practice that is hard to practice. Um, speaking of which, speaking of which, I have been explaining in in my other. Uh, my other life as a sutra lecturer, I'm explaining the Vajra Prajna Paramita Sutra and being challenged by it. Oh, the Vajra Sutra is, is a challenge to explain. It's hard because it proceeds, it begins from samadhi, from that place of emptiness. That is Prajna, right? Prajna is step six on the Bodhisattva's path. And that's not step one, that's step six. So. It begins there. Your samadhi has allowed you to see past the surface of, of self and dharmas and emptied them both out. So it's hard, it's a challenge, and I'm enjoying it a lot. And I've got a supportive community, including the monks on, uh, who are on in our lecture today, helping me clarify and elucidate and bring light to the Vajra. Or not that the Vajra Sutra needs light, but uh, we bring it into people's, we share it with people. So, uh, in my other life as a lecturer on the Vajra Sutra, we're almost done with that, and we've had a question, we've had actually had a poll of what sutra to explain next. This is, those of you who are listening to the Avatamsaka and saying, what are you talking about? Um, I also, on, in the Western Hemisphere, it's Fridays, Friday afternoon in Berkeley, California. It's Friday evening in Europe. Um, it's Saturday morning very early here in the Southern Hemisphere in, in Asia. Uh, so if you, it's 5.30 here in Australia, AEST, the Eastern, Australian Eastern Standard. It's 3.30 in Taiwan, 3.30 in Hong Kong, 3.30 in Beijing and Shanghai and Zhejiang. So that's really, really early. Oh boy. So uh, I explain the Vajra Sutra, and uh, uh, let's see here. Um, could somebody, uh, Jerry, would you mind, or somebody online, uh, typing the audit, typing the address of how you get to, to that? Um, I have a text. Where's my? Here's here we go. All right, let me scroll down here. Is it BerkeleyMonastery.org to get on the list? get on the name list? I think so. I think you go to www.berkeleymonastery.org. There it is. And when you get to berkeleymonastery.org, you look around for uh, Vajra Sutra, Reverend Hungshur's Vajra Sutra lectures. Um, the reason is it's on Zoom, and we have to, we, we invite you that we keep it, keep it, uh, clean that way. Fewer Zoom bombs, right? So, berkeleymonastery.org. If you decide you'd like to try it, check it out. It's an hour lecture once a week. And why am I telling you about that in our Avatamsaka lecture? It's because we are, there we go. Uh-huh. So, I'm going to, got it right there. One more time here. Try again. Copy that. Paste that. There we go. Friday hyphen noon hyphen rev hyphen hung hyphen sure hyphen online hyphen class dot html. Repeat after me, everybody. Okay. You can also go uh, yeah, Berkeley Monastery. There it is. Okay, so what are we going to do when we come to the end of the Vajra Sutra lecture series? We had a poll. We asked people what they'd like to hear. And lots of people said, we want to hear the Lotus Sutra. <laughs> so do I, friends, uh, want to hear the Lotus Sutra. Um, it's too long to do once a week. Um, if we did it once a week, we'd be lecturing, uh, explaining it for uh, many years, right? 
Vajra Sutra is wonderful and uh, sublime, um, but it's a little too long to do once a week. We'd have to do it once a day, and we could. We could do it once a day, we'd still be explaining it for two years. Um, so we thought, what about a piece of the Lotus Sutra? Well, Universal Door Chapter, Guan Yin, everybody loves Guan Yin. And then we thought, yeah, but you know, we've, I've done the Universal Door Chapter of the Lotus Sutra several times. Uh, once in, in, at, uh, at the Translation Institute in Burlingame and once in Berkeley. But what I have not explained before ever is uh, the practices of repentance uh, particularly because my doctoral dissertation, my PhD is on repentance, particularly the Avatamsaka repentance, the, the, the ceremony based on this text that we're explaining today. And I have lots and lots and lots of material and it would be a series of lectures and uh, discussions for all of us on this particular dharma practice called repentance. And it is, as our sutra mentions today, nan xing zhi heng. It's a difficult practice to engage in and to master because um, the, the simple statement, what is the simplest essential repentance practice? It's to say, I've looked at my behavior and I was wrong. I'm sorry and I want to change. Chan hui, right? Different from chan kui, chan kui, chan hui, chan kui in Chinese. There are various terms in Chinese that have been traditionally used to talk about this. And what it boils down to is you look at your behavior and you say, whoa, that was wrong. Why do you say that? Because the feedback you got, what you saw, the results, you noticed. You were paying attention. You were watching. And you thought, I want to do it differently. What can I learn from this? Can I do it differently? Can I start over? So that's uh, the wise monks and nuns of the Mahayana tradition um, who have done this, have taken it to a real uh, a sublime, wonderful stage, which is what, where it actually gets into our karmic balance sheet of merit, blessings, and offenses, and wrongs. And you can repent to the place where you actually get back to influencing, you could say, your conscious stream. And that's wonderful. You become a karmic engineer of your own life. So I'm thinking particularly of Master Jirja, Jiryi Jirja Dashi. He was a monk uh, in Tian Tai Shan and other places in Zhejiang, eastern, southeastern China. And he, uh, he himself practiced repentance, particularly the Fang Deng, the Vaipulya repentance. He did it every day, and he combined repentance with sitting, seated meditation, with, with Chan and repentance, and woke up, got enlightened this way, and went on to propagate this method uh, at, with strength at great length in China. So we have a tradition of repentances. I looked into, for my, the, the research that I did, I looked into the Avatamsaka repentance, which was written at the early, early years of the Song Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty was over and the purge of Buddhism that followed the Tang, Emperor, the infamous Emperor Wu, right? His purge had ended. And in Hangzhou, the, t the city of Hangzhou, there was a flourishing school of repentance writing. Now look at this, this is interesting. I'm, I'm giving you a preview a little bit, and mind you, we have not made up our minds. We haven't decided. This is a, we're checking this out to see whether we can do it. 
um, there was a, almost a school, I don't think it was an official school, there was a flourishing, there was a uh, renaissance of repentance liturgy writing in Hangzhou uh, at, the, at the early years of the Song Dynasty. And a, uh, a monk known as Jingyuan, Jingyuan Sanzang, um, wrote, took the Avatamsaka Sutra and turned it into a repentance. In fact, three, three different, long, a medium, and a short one. And repentances are written by people. They're based on the Buddha's wisdom, but they are written by monks, by and large. And this is one of them. This uh, uh, Avatamsaka repentance liturgy. And it's wonderful uh, because it contains the, this wisdom distilled from the sutra. Um, into repentance form. So it's sutras you can bow, right? And one of the things about repentance liturgies is they come with a verb. And what's the verb? To bow a repentance. Repentances have this, they, they have a yoga that comes with them. And the yoga is repentances. Right? I'm sorry, the yoga is bowing. You make a prostration. And uh, that is a big part of the process. Uh, it's, a, it's physical. Repentance bowing is physical. And renewing, right, the actual cleansing, coming clean, just like, you know, our new videos these days that show us how to wash every bit of our hands and, you know, use our fingers to scrub, the hand washing, that process is facilitated by making a prostration. The bowing, if it's done right, washes clean inside and brings to mind the actual behavior and the thoughts that motivated the behavior so that we can get in there and say I can do it better next time I'm going to improve I'm going to renew right start over so there's a lot a lot a lot in uh the, uh, this dharma of repentance that I think I would be happy to share because I haven't done it before. I've, I've got, I wrote a book, right? My dissertation is a book on repentance, bowing, in the Avatamsaka Sutra, and I'd like to share. So I think it's looking like, Sam, you think? Yes? Good practice. Okay, thumbs up. Alex, yes? Good. Two thumbs up. Okay. Can I get three thumbs up? I only have two hands. So uh, I think we may look into that. Okay, thumbs up online too. All right, so we had a question here. Uh, I repent, but I do it again. I'm angry at people and I'm ashamed of my action. Why did I do it? What did I do? Yeah, uh, you could substitute for getting angry at people a whole, a whole line of things like, oh boy, right? Chocolate. <laughs> I, one bite of chocolate was great. I finished the entire box, right? Pizza, I ate the entire pizza. How could I be so greedy, right? I, I gave my spouse the stink eye again, and it felt so bad, and I did it again, right? So substitute any of those behaviors that we wish we could change, you bet. You bet. What you, when, we, when we decide that we want to change and renew, what we come right up against face to face is habit, the power of habits. But the mind is plastic. The mind is flexible. The mind is plastic like what? Like the earth. Perfect analogy. That's called the shindi, right? The mind ground. What is the mind like? The mind is the mind, our, my mind, your mind. The Buddha's mind is just like the earth. And what is the earth like? It's a conditioned dharma uh, made up of many components and you can shape it, you can mold it, you can harden it, you can soften it, you can mix it with water, you can amend it, add fertilizer. You can make the mind into something just like 
the air. They always talk about the mind like space, right, like emptiness. And that's hard work. Uh, you can also turn the mind into something as hard as concrete, unable to change. Of course, it's just not. It's habit. It's what we do with it. So, yeah, and, medicine, and repentance is a, a method for doing that. So we're thinking. It's, now, when will we shift over? Probably another two months to finish the Vajra Sutra. And we also talked about uh, trying to recite together that one of the things we want to do with the Vajra Sutra before we're done is actually practice it as a group um, and recite it. But the thing about this lecture series is English. It's English language. So I don't want to excite people. If Chinese listeners are listening in and thinking, yes, 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 who, who's translating it? Now, this one is in English, this, this series. It's only an hour, an hour once a week. So. Uh, if it's a great opportunity, you're welcome to learn some English while you're there, right? So, but it's, so far it's English. Alrighty, uh, now, let's go back to our text and finish up. What did it say? It's the same as the Bodhisattva who was appointed to this rank. When the Buddhas anoint the crown of his head with water, he be, the water of wisdom, he's appointed to the rank. He can make perfect the ten powers of Tathagata. So, he is counted among the Buddhas now. He's qualified, he's certified, he is authentic. This is known as the Bodhisattva's appointment to the ranks of great wisdom. Through this appointment, the Bodhisattva cultivates limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis and nayutas of practices that are hard to do. He increases his limitless wisdom and virtue. How can, if it's limitless, how do you increase it, right? Well, he does. This is called peaceful dwelling on the stage of the Dharma cloud, stable abiding. He's secure there. He's reached the tenth stage now. And with that is the end of the preface, the end of the introduction. I'm going to read um, just a few lines of the next part to kind of launch us in, right? How does it go? It goes like this. Fozi pusa mohasa zhu ci fa yun di Ru shi zhi yu jie qi, si jie qi, wu si jie qi, shi jie qi, fa jie qi. All right. Disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva who abides upon the stage of the Dharma cloud knows as it truly is how the desire realm accumulates, how the form realm accumulates, how the formless realm accumulates, how the worldly realm accumulates, how the Dharma realm accumulates. All right, that's just five. Let's see, desire, form, formless, world, and Dharma, right. There are 17 of these accumulations, and we're gonna go into them, not today, but um, I wanted to mention what what is this accumulation? I'm gonna kind of seed it out there, plant the seed. This accumulation stumped me at first. What is a ji in Chinese? It's a picture of a short-tailed bird on a branch, <laughs> interestingly. Chui, it's a, they get ji zi, huh? Yo shang bian, yo xia bian, yo kuai mu, yi ke shu, hai yo yi tiao niao, yi zhi niao, right? So it's a bird on a tree. And what does that have to do with accumulating? Well. If you look at my desktop here, we've got two kookaburras. We've got a father and a son. <laughs> and the, uh, the son is accum the accumulation. Notice he is pretty scruffy looking. He's going through his rebellious phase. Uh, he's kind of a hipster kookaburra here with his, uh, his fancy haircut and his looking away from his dad. He knows so much more than his dad, clearly. And he wants his, he's, he's rolling his eyes at his father, who's so traditional. But this is a phase of an adolescent kookaburra goes through. And I like this picture because it shows the challenge of generations teaching, right? Uh, the dad is the bodhisattva determined to cross over his son to wisdom, keep him alive. And the kid is determined to test his own wings and find out how far he can fly. So classic, classic crisis here of uh, the uh, opportunities for learning, 
and <laughs> exhibition of ignorance on the part of the, the, uh, the teenager, right? Oh, boy. So uh, there we have it. The accumulation corresponds to what? I'll just, just put this out there. Um, this word that the Chinese chose to translate um, I don't know the Sanskrit. Maybe Jin Chuan. Jin Chuan, are you there? Can you type in the Sanskrit for the second noble truth? The first is dukkha. What's the second one? I'm curious about that. Okay, I'll look for it. Yeah, it's the Chinese say, zhi ku duan ji mu mie xiu dao. These are the four noble truths. The first thing the Buddha taught was recognize suffering as it is. Recognize what is really unsatisfying. No, no dukkha. Get to know dukkha because it's underlying everything that is comes together is coming apart and the suffering involved. But the second noble truth is he said, "Duan, cut off, get rid of qi." And what is ji? We always translate it as accumulation. Why do you cut off accumulation? What's wrong with that? Well, it's deeper than simply accumulation. It's creation. The Four Noble Truths that the Buddha taught arise from this place of nothing going on. Samadhi, right? Everything's fine from the Buddha's ultimate wisdom. There's nothing going on. You can rest in that place of samadhi. And anybody who's, all of you meditators, who have gotten past the noise of the mind, past the squirrel cage of the mind, right, to that, you maybe get, it's two seconds of stillness. If you meditate, you can get to that place pretty quickly of where briefly there's an interval in the rising of thoughts. You see the, the canvas behind the paint. Uh, you could say, let's switch which are metaphors. If the mind is like an inn, like a B and B, and the thoughts are the guests, you get to that place where the inn is ready for the guests, and there's there's a brief pause in the flow of guests, right? And to meditate to that place is profoundly rewarding. Okay, so G is the arising, is the guest that knocks on the door. We, we're here. Can somebody help me with my suitcases? Right. That's the G. And worlds come about because of G. Shrifa would say what? Master Hua would say, fundamentally there's nothing going on but living beings make their mark. <laughs> Basically there's nothing happening but living beings, just we get out there and mess it up. We show up and the drama begins, right? So G is that. It's that second noble truth. Have you got it, Jin Chuan? Did you find the... Still looking for... Here's yeah, I've heard there is Samudhya. Sam Mudaya. Sam Samudaya. Samudaya. Okay. Origin of suffering. Origin of suffering. Oh, Sam I always said Samudaya, but Samudaya. Yeah, Samudaya. it's not a Samudaya. Samudaya. Origin, Samudaya. source arising, coming to existence, aggregate, constituent, element. Okay, I'm going to copy all that. We are uh, using Zoom's chat function. Here's our notes page. There we go. There it is, Samudaya. What's the Chinese? Can you all see there? It is this word. It's a very interesting word. Qi. Hello. There it is. Qi, like that. But I think the key idea is saying that the origin of suffering is coming from craving or, or this tanha or thirst. So rather than externalizing it, it's looking at the mind or the source of suffering. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, it was always, whenever, I mean, that was the way we always described it was the second noble truth has to do with where the dukkha comes from. First is recognize dukkha. The second is see where it arises. Where, what's the source of the dukkha? And it was ji in the Chinese. It's a craving. But now 
I'm seeing it uh, in a new way ever since I connected. I, I ran into translating the 10th stage, right? So our bodhisattva has now been anointed on the crown as, a, as the, the, he's, he's now in, joined the ranks of the Buddhas in his wisdom. He's still a bodhisattva, but his wisdom is the same. So the next thing we meet is 17 kinds of G. I was like, what? Why is it talking about compiling of arising, of coming into existence, of uh, clustering, of accumulating? Why? What was that about? And then I realized that's the second noble truth. And that's where we're going to find the gold, right? To understanding why the first, once the bodhisattva gets all his wisdom, what does he look at? He looks at the second noble truth, the same word here. And I think it has to do with what pulls us out of our stillness. What pulls us out of our wisdom is this making our mark, right? Everything was copacetic and groovy, and then we couldn't be peaceful. We had to go mess it up. We had to go make our mark and say that thing or, you know, so we were peaceful and full at home, and then we looked outside and, you know. So it's, the, I, here, oh, I got it right here. It's the fundamental itch uh, the, there's an in uh, beginningless beginning beginningless dark movement there we go in our repentance liturgies the Dabe Chan says beginningless dark movement there it is that's G right there it's the thing that says no I'm not content anymore I was content and everything was good I'm not content anymore and guess what karma and guess what retribution and suffering and the turning wheel goes on right before the movement is nirvana nothing produced nothing destroyed doesn't come doesn't go no birth no death soon as G happens it's that itch and we act and we're pulled right back into existence so that's I think what G is Anyway, we're going to pick up there next week, and it's, it's really, really rich. And one of the um, primary things that people do that is the worst thing that humans do is warfare. And I'm going to shift our focus right this minute um, to a song. Yesterday in... Australia and New Zealand was Anzac Day. And Anzac Day Anzac Day is a commemoration. The the key word, the phrase is lest we forget. It's a commemoration of the brave men and women who left Australia and New Zealand, the UK, France, Canada, uh, parts of Europe, to go to Gallipoli, the Gallipoli Peninsula in the Dardanelles Straits, not too far from Istanbul, Turkey, and died in the First World War in 1915. And it was a military blunder on the part of, among others, Winston Churchill, among others. He was, it was planners of the war, thinking that by attacking and conquering that part of Turkey, it's a peninsula there, that they would be able to bring their warships around and surround the, the Kaiser's forces and win World War I. It was a tragic, costly mistake. Quarter of a million men died um, and, were, uh, and got sick or were maimed 
and blinded and crippled. Um, an equal number, a shockingly equal number of deaths happen on the Turkish side and the Allies side. But it was one of the beginnings of awareness of Australian statehood and New Zealand statehood when they sent so many troops over to die far away. And the, the cost militarily was staggering, the cost in lives. And uh, it, it was a founding incident for Australia and New Zealand. Um, as much as the Civil War was for the U.S., kind of our birth in blood of national awareness, uh, ANZAC and the Gallipoli campaign was for Australia. And one of the um, results of this historical event was a song by a man named Eric Bogle, a songwriter. It's the number one anti-war song that I've ever heard. And if people would like to hear a version, uh, I'm going to sing it now because I sing it every Anzac Day. And uh, more people need to know, I think, outside of. Uh, yesterday, because of uh, s social distancing, the, the Anzac Day ceremony usually happens at dawn because it's sunrise in Turkey. It's, uh, it's the daylight in Turkey and it's dawn here. And people come together all over Australia and New Zealand to, uh, to hear the, uh, the bugler play Last Post. It's, it's the equivalent of taps for Western, for American military. And yesterday, because of social distancing, everybody gathered on their driveways around Australia. And in Canberra at the military uh, monument, a didgeridoo player, a military man, played the didgeridoo and uh, then the plate of the bugle played the taps, played the last post. Uh, young <coughs> saw a young woman play her violin, played last post and cellos. And, uh, it's very, very, very moving, reminding us while the utmost respect to our ancestors who went over and died, um, if they had the choice to do it again, they would probably say, don't go to war, avoid, this, avoid the suffering. So anyway, this song tells that story. So I'd like to share the, uh, the band played Waltzing Matilda. It mentions Gallipoli, that's the peninsula in Turkey. It mentions Suvla Bay, which was the spit of land where the uh, diggers landed and tried to go up this mountain and the Turks were all dug in with German uh, artillery and blasted straight down onto the Australian and Allied forces and, as he says in the song, blew them all to hell in five minutes flat. Now when I was a young man, I carried me pack and I lived the free life of a rover. From the Murray's Green Basin to the dusty outback While well, I watched my Matilda all over Then in 1915 my country said, son It's time you stopped rambling, there's work to be done So they gave me a tin hat and they gave me a gun and they marched me away to the war And the band played waltzing Matilda As the ship pulled away from the quay And amongst all the cheers, the flag waving and tears We sailed off for Gallipoli Oh, how well I remember that terrible day How our blood stained the sand and the water And of how in that hell that they called Suvla Bay We were butchered like lambs at the slaughter 
Johnny Turk, he was waiting, he primed himself well. He showered us with bullets and he rained us with shell. And in five minutes flat, blown us all to hell. Nearly blew us right back to Australia. But the band played waltzing Matilda When we stopped to bury our slain We buried ours and the Turks buried theirs Then we started all over again And those that were left, well, we tried to survive In that mad world of blood, death, and fire And for ten weary weeks I kept myself alive Though around me the corpses piled higher Then a big Turkish shell knocked me ass overhead And when I woke up in my hospital bed Saw what it had done Well, I wished I was dead Never knew there was worse things than dying Or no more I'll go waltzing Matilda All around the green bush Far and free To hump tent and pegs a man needs both legs No more waltzing Matilda for me So they gathered the crippled, the wounded, the maimed And they shipped us back off to Australia The legless, the armless, the blind, the insane those proud wounded heroes of Suvla And as our ship pulled into Circular Quay I looked at the place where my legs used to be And I thank Christ there was nobody waiting for me To grieve, to mourn, and to pity But the band played waltzing Matilda as they carried us down the gangway But nobody cheered They just stood and they stared Then they all turned their faces away So now every April I sit on me porch And I watch the parades pass before me And I see my old comrades How proudly they march Reviving old dreams of past glories And the old men march slowly Old bones stiff and sore They're tired old heroes From a forgotten war And the young people ask what are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question But the band plays waltzing Matilda And the old men still answer the call But as year follows year More old men disappear Someday no one will march there at all Waltzing Matilda Waltzing Matilda And their ghosts may be heard As they march by that billabong Come a waltzing Matilda with me
So there we go. Thank you, Eric Bogle, for a song that will survive this experience. So this is Anzac Day. Yesterday was Anzac Day. Australian New Zealand Auxiliary Corps, Army Corps, Army Corps. So uh, Italy celebrated the 75th anniversary of the end of the fascist dictatorship of Mussolini in 1945 today. So repentance is, what is it? it? It's evolution to be able to say, we did that wrong, can we do it better? Now, I need to say that I come from a military family. Uh, my father and my brother, my uncles, um, serve proudly and a country needs a strong military. Uh, it's just real politic, it's wisdom to be strong outside so that you don't have to go to war. If you, it is human nature, we have greed, anger, and delusion inside, and if we appear vulnerable and easily conquered, that greed and anger can arise, especially if there's karmic, residual karmic debts owed, so that a stronger force will try to invade, which they will not do if we are militarily strong, if we have a solid outer shell, we can withhold, withstand. That's, uh, Master Xuanhua uh, taught that. Um, he was not, he's a pacifist and also a realist. So when you look at nature, you look at uh, animals from tigers to uh, kookaburras, the conflicts are solved by showing force. They don't actually shed blood, rarely, rarely. The only time this happens is when there's a female involved and the stupid males will compete to show who's the stronger so they get to be the father of the next generation, right? But uh, humans don't seem to have that wisdom. We go to war often simply because of greed, and we need a chance to use the, the weapons that we've stockpiled, and that's where it gets insane. So songs like Band Played Waltzing Matilda remind us of what's at stake. All right, enough of that. Uh, it's never too late to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, I don't wanna do that again and change. So that's hard to practice. Our bodhisattvas, limitless, hard to practice practices. Practices that are difficult to practice. Okay, um, do we have any comments from the monks? Anybody have a, something you'd care to share about today's uh, conclusion of the introduction of the bodhisattva being anointed on the crown? Nothing to share, okay. Um, I want to remind everybody that if you go to berkeleymonastery.org, there it is right there, you can find a, a day of practice with the monks. The Sangha at berkeleymonastery.org has put their practices online, including morning and evening chanting, chanting the Buddha's name, meditation, with uh, reflections at the end, uh, bowing, um, a new sutra lecture on the Medicine Buddha, and uh, also uh, the Wuliang Shou Jing, the Sutra of Limitless Life Span, lectured in uh, Mandarin with an English translation. So lots of activities at the Berkeley Monastery, berkeleymonastery.org. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't show you something quite wonderful that happened last night at the Berkeley Monastery outdoors, which was what we had a, uh, the new baby, the new generation, 
of brush-tailed possums came. This is Polly Possum. This is her first solo going to eat at the food dish without mom. Look at this fluffy morsel. This little possum has been alive for about three months maybe. And it's chilly now, it's autumn, so she's all fluffed out. Look at how cute, right? That is a brand new life, carrying on the proud tradition of brush-tailed possums here in the Queensland bush. Oh my goodness. What a little furry morsel. So we're invested in trying to keep, now all of you New Zealand, all of our Kiwi friends who are watching this, please understand that uh, <laughs> we know your pain. Uh, possums are not universally celebrated in New Zealand. They have no natural enemies. Not the case. In fact, we are trying hard to keep Polly Possum alive because uh, there are many things that would turn her into a snack. She is just the right size for a python to swallow. So every, uh, Alex and I wait at night to see if she's still alive. And last night she was indeed. So, oh boy, oh boy. Real life uh, here in the Queensland bush. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if you have nowhere else to transfer merit, please transfer merit to the humanity on planet Earth. Um, 150 of us online today. How are we doing in the Chinese wing? How many do we have on the Chinese side? 40? 64, 64. Good, good, good. 150 listening on YouTube. Excellent. So, um, humanity is suffering a lot. Coronavirus, COVID-19 is now causing strokes. It's doing strange things with blood clotting among young people. Uh, there's a trend now and being discovered in America and the hospitals in the East Coast of people in their 30s and 40s dying of strokes as their blood coagulates. Uh, so coronavirus is really uh, not wholesome for the human body. Don't drink bleach, by the way. Don't inject insecticides or any kind of uh, Clorox or, you know, it's uh, despite what certain people in authority might have you do, injecting disinfectant into your body, don't. Won't help you. Um, okay, transfer the merit to wisdom and compassion. Here we go. <laughs> Make a wish and send it out as far as your mind can go. May every living being, our minds as one and with life, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all Sorrow, leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all Compassion and wise. May 
may all become compassionate and wise. Have a week full of wisdom and blessings. See you all next week. Omi Tofu. Bye-bye, everybody.